Hi friends, as part of Civilspedia, today we will be discussing four topics. Today's topics are Acinetobacter Juni, Aspirational Districts Program, Direct Tax Collection and Subhash Chandra Bose. We will start with Acinetobacter Juni. This topic is regarding a recent article in Hindu newspaper and the article was Bacteria to Degrade Toluene. You know toluene is a chemical compound and it is also one of the petrochemical waste that get released without treatment from industries such as refineries, paint, textile, paper and rubber. So it's a chemical compound. It is released as a petrochemical waste from these industries. And when this chemical it is released into the environment without treatment, it affects the environment as well as human health. It causes serious health problems to aquatic life and also has genotoxic and carcinogenic effects on human beings. Genotoxic agent means it can be a chemical or other agents which causes alterations in the cellular DNA. That is it can result in mutations or formation of cancer. So it is a potential carcinogenic agent to human health as well as it is causes problems to aquatic life also. Recently, researchers from University of Delhi and IIT Varanasi, that is the Banaras Hindu University, they succeeded in degrading toluene to a less toxic byproduct. And this was done by isolating a set of bacteria from different types of bacteria. And that bacteria is known as Acinetobacter juni. And it was this why this bacteria was selected because it was found that it had good degrading potential. And uh, the bacteria, it was not a single strain of bacteria that was used. A consortium of Acinetobacter juni was used to degrade this toluene. What they did was they introduced a sample containing toluene. That is around 50 ppm of toluene was there in the sample. It was found that within 72 hours, 80% of the toluene was used by this uh, bacteria. Now for this, the bacteria was isolated from soil and effluents near an oil refinery. Now how this bacteria degrades the toluene? It follows an aerobic biodegradation pathway. Biodegradation means it is the breaking down of organic molecules using microorganisms. And this biodegradation it can be done by two methods either aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic means the biodegradation it is done in the presence of oxygen and anaerobic means in the absence of oxygen. In most cases, waste degradation, it involves the use of bacteria which grows in anaerobic uh, uh, method. While here the difference is that this bacteria, it follows the aerobic biodegradation pathway. So here it uses up this toluene as their carbon source in the presence of oxygen. Thus the main difference is the aerobic biodegradation pathway that is followed by this bacteria. Now, it was also seen that when this bacteria was introduced to this toluene, it, under, it underwent certain morphological changes. That is, it changed from its cylindrical cells was transformed into an ovoid or spherical structure. This was mainly done to avoid the toxicity of toluene. So, this uh, bacteria, it is used to degrade the toluene, which is a petrochemical waste. But th now, this uh, studies, it has been done at the laboratory stages only. More studies are needed to um, develop and design a industrial level, um, uh, industrial level bacterium, which will, which can be used to degrade this petrochemical waste. Moving to our next topic, it is aspirational districts program. This program was launched by our Honorable Prime Minister in January 2018 and the name of this program it is Transformation of Aspirational Districts Program. The main focus of this program is on India's most backward district and the main aim is to improve the socio-economic status of 117 districts from across 28 states. So these 117 districts was identified as some of the most backward districts in different states of India. And the program, its main focus is to identify the strength of each district and also the identify low hanging fruits for immediate improvement that is identify the strength as well as identify the weakness so that there can be an immediate improvement. Then measure the progress of each of these districts and finally rank this district. 
For this, there are three core principles of the program and the first one is convergence of central and state schemes so that there is no overlapping of the schemes. Instead, they will there will be a convergence of the schemes and they will together try for an inclusive growth. Next is the collaboration among citizens and functionaries of the central and state government, including district teams. So this ensures a participatory form of governance and to bring in grassroots level participation. And finally, competition among districts. That is a healthy competition among districts to develop infrastructure in these most backward districts. Now, how these districts are chosen? It is chosen by senior officials of the union government in consultation with the state officials on the basis of a composite index and this index is made with uh, by certain uh, criteria that is deprivation enumerated under the socio-economic caste census, key health and education performance indicators and the state of basic infrastructure. So based on these factors a composite index is uh, first made and based on that index this 117 districts has been chosen. The main focus of this program, it is on five main themes and the main themes are health and nutrition, education, agriculture and water resources, financial inclusion and skill development and basic infrastructure. Why these five main themes? Because they have a direct bearing on the uh, quality of life and also on the economic productivity of the people. And it is a, uh, actually a collaborative program in which States are the main drivers and at the national level, at the government of India level, the program is anchored by Niti Aayog. To monitor the progress of this program, Niti Aayog it has partnered with the government of Andhra Pradesh and has created a dashboard for monitoring this real-time progress of this district. And for this uh, monitoring of the district, they have identified 49 key indicators under these five main themes and on the basis of these key indicators they will monitor the progress of the districts and rank this program. So this program is committed in improving the living conditions of the people in this most backward district as well as to bring inclusive growth in these districts. Coming to our next topic it is direct tax collection. You know direct tax it is paid directly by an individual or organization to the imposing entity. That means the liability of paying tax, it is non-transferable. So if uh, tax is uh, imposed on a, on a person or an individual or an organization, they are directly paying it to, it to the imposing entity. This is the main difference between direct and indirect tax because in indirect tax, the burden of tax is transferable to some other taxpayer. Now, the Central Board of Direct Tax or the CBDT, it is responsible for the administration of direct taxation in India. And this, uh, uh, this CBDT, it is a statutory body formed under the Central Board of Revenue Act 1924 and it is a part of the Revenue Department under the Ministry of Finance. Example for direct taxes, it, it is income tax, corporate tax, capital gains tax, etc. Income tax, you know, it is the tax levied on your personal income. And corporate tax, it is the tax levied on the income or the profit of the corporate entities. And capital gains tax, it is the tax levied on capital gains or the, or the tax levied on the profits of uh, some uh, sale of some assets or investments. According to the recent data, it was seen that the contribution of direct taxes to the total tax revenue has been increasing. You know the importance of total tax revenue for the government because as the tax revenue increases, government can use that money for implementing various government schemes and social welfare programs. So it is all, the government will always try to increase the tax revenue. And the contribution of direct tax to total tax revenue, it is been increasing. If you see, in 2001, it was just 36.3 percentage. And uh, in the second week of October 2017-18, it has been approximately 53 percentage. So in the past 10 to 15 years, there was a gradual increase. Net direct tax collection in the country grew by 15.7 percent. And the income tax department, they received 5.8 crore IT returns by October 21st of this year. And in the last year, it was just 3.6 crore. So this shows that there is a widening and deepening of taxpayer base in the country.
as ta as as the tax payer base increases the tax revenue also increases which is good for the government uh, and plus at present the tax payer base of india is more than 6.26 crore and government is continuously trying to increase this tax payer base also coming to the ta tax and gdp ratio there is a constant growth in the direct tax gdp ratio over the last 3 years and this financial year that is the 2017 18 financial year the direct tax to the gdp ratio is seen as 5.98 percentage and this ratio is the best direct tax gdp ratio in the last 10 years so that is the importance of direct tax coming to the last topic of the day it is subhash chandra bose he is one of the most prolific uh, freedom fighters of india he was born in katak in odisha on january 23 1897 is one of the most dynamic leaders of india's struggle of independence and is fondly known as neda ji neda means leader Uh, after schooling he was sent to london to train for the civil service examination and in 1920 he passed the civil service examination but uh, the incidents that was happening during the, that time like the jallianwala bag massacre and the corresponding british incident uh, british reaction to the indian freedom struggle he resigned his candidacy and he joined the indian national congress under the influence of mahatma gandhi so he joined the inc in 1921 and at the same time he also started a newspaper called swaraj uh, but from the time of joining indian national congress he has been speaking in clear terms in support of socialism you know that nehru and bose was uh, one of the most prominent leaders who supported the socialist factor in indian national congress and especially during 1927 anti simon um, anti simon protest both of these leaders had a um, very good impact on the youth and younger generation and there was a big uh, participation of youths in the anti simon protest at that from that time these both leaders were very prominent in the um, freedom struggle of india and he became the congress president in 1938 and 1939 in 1938 it was in the haripura session It was in the Haripura session that Subhash Chandra Bose became the uh, president of Indian National Congress for the first time. In 1939, he contested against Patabi Sidara Maya, who was brought by Mahatma Gandhi. Though Subhash Bose won uh, the election because of ideological differences between Gandhi, he resigned and he started the All India Forward Bloc in 1939 as a faction within the Congress. Later, he was kept under house arrest and he escaped from it and went to Russia and Germany to seek the Nazi support to free India from the hands of British. Later, he reached he sided with Japan and he reached Singapore. and there he revamped the indian national army or the ina which was mostly of the prisoners of wars which japan captured during the uh, second world war and in the indian national army he even gave very importance to women also there was a separate women wings in the ina coming to some facts about subhash chandra bose he gave us the national salute jai hind in 1941 also he set up india's first national planning committee in 1938 under the leadership of jawaharlal nehru so this was during the haripura session when he was the president of indian national congress and this first national planning committee was also set up then he gave formal instrumentation for janaganamana the national anthem in 1942 and hoisted tricolor on free indian soil after liberating port blair in 1943 also he formalized the ban gala as india's official dress you can see this dress in the figure in the picture and that is the ban gala dress he formalized this dress as india's official dress recently our honorable prime minister narendra modi he joined the flag hoisting ceremony in red fort in the 75th anniversary of azad hind government headed by subhash chandra bose and this azad hind government it was established on October 21st 1943 in Singapore if you see traditionally prime minister hoist the flags in red fort on the independence day that is august 15 this decision to hoist flag on red fort was taken mainly because the soldiers of ina indian national army they faced trial by the british on uh, in the red fort because of this to commemorate that they uh, hoisted a flag on the red fort 
Now, if you see this Azad Hind government, it can be seen as one of India's first free government which was set up in uh, Singapore, outside India. Though it was set up outside India, it had a very good impact on impact at that time. Especially because in the 1940, uh, in 1943 uh, and all, Cute India movement was going on and most of the prominent leaders were behind the bus. At that time, to set up a government like this and to uh, bring the Indian, Indian National Army, it had a great impact on the freedom fighters. Now, if you see, the provincial government had been acknowledged by 11 countries including Japan, Nanking, China, Thailand, Burma, Italy, Germany and the Philippines. And it had its embassies in other countries also. On August 14, 1944, the Bahadur Brigade of the Indian National Army led by Colonel Shaukat Ali Malik, they captured Moirang, a town in Manipur on the Indo-Myanmar border. I said at the time of Cute India movement, when most of the leaders were behind the bus to capture a region from the British hands, it was a great uh, impact. It had a great boost on the morale of the freedom fighters. And this Moirang, it remained under the control of Assad Hind government for nearly four months during which its currency and the stamps too were used. And this slogan, it is the famous slogan of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose that is, give me blood and I will give you freedom. And unfortunately, he didn't live to see the India getting freedom. He was, uh, sub he was considered as the, died in a plane crash in 1945. That's all for today. Thank you for your time.